Shortly, we're gonna start joining the lead keel and the wood keel together. And as soon as we do that, we need to start fitting the dead wood. So since it's still a little too cold, you can tell by the way we're dressed here, to do the painting and fit those together, we're trying to move as much ahead in the process as we can. So we're starting to rough out the dead wood and make the patterns for that. In preparation for doing the keel assembly, uh, I'm going to take all of these big timbers that we originally thought we were going to use for the bow and stern posts and cut out all the checks and the defects and get ready to glue them back together uh, into two big beams that will become the deadwood for Arabella. So one piece of deadwood will go in front of the ballast keel and the other piece will go in the back of it and basically forms the keel underneath the boat and gives it its shape. When the plans were originally drawn, they were drawn with an iron keel. You can see the outline of that here. And that goes under pretty much the whole bottom of the boat. And then, since lead is so much denser, the lead keel is represented by these blue lines here. So what we need to do is fill out four of that and aft of that with dead wood. And you can see that's, that's quite a bit of timber. So it's about 14 inches wide up here, 10 inches wide down here, and tapers back to about 6 inches where it meets the stern. And same thing in the bow, it's a little narrower and then goes to 6 inches. So what we're going to do is cut up those timbers and jigsaw these together. The giant wood keel here is the main structural timber of the boat. So this deadwood, it does add some strength and we don't want it to be, you know, a weak or a flimsy thing, but it gets through bolted up to this wood keel. So by the time we put a couple fillets of five, six inch thick timber and glue that together and bolt that together, that'll be plenty strong for what we need it to do. And if for some reason down the road, one of those glue lines were to fail and some water were to get in there and this were to rot, there will be bedding compound and paint that goes between the deadwood and the wood keel. So worst case scenario, we could haul the boat, replace the aft or the four piece of deadwood. And although a project and although a pain in the butt, it wouldn't be a catastrophic thing to have to do. So these timbers, we originally thought we were going to use them for the bow and the stern posts, but like I said, they checked pretty badly. Um, so this way we can cut around those checks and we can still use them. So before I can throw it up on the bandsaw and cut it, I need to get it down to a more manageable size, which is what I'm going to do today with the skill saw or with the big saw squatch. And then once they're down to a size that I can lift and move, I'll put them on the bandsaw. And the goal today is just to get a bunch of square pieces set off to the side. And then once we get back from the boat show this weekend, hopefully the weather will be good enough and we can get to putting these keels together. And then when it comes time to need the dead wood, we can start planing them and thicknessing them and gluing them together. And it also needs to get warmer for us to glue. So I'm trying to chisel away it as much as we can and be as prepared as we can for when the warm weather comes. So Steve mentioned the boat show we were to go to. With winter being such a slow time, we decided we'd capitalize on a different aspect of the journey. And part of that is to drum up a little bit of excitement and interest in projects like this. So we've been talking to people, we've been making trips. Here's a couple of them. On a recent trip up to down East Maine to visit my sister and my mother, I stopped in Rockland to visit the apprentice shop, but more importantly to meet with Joao Bentes. Joao has an epic project of his own. He's building a traditional Portuguese sardine carrier, which he's then gonna sail across the Atlantic and set up an itinerant school, bringing with him some of the main culture to Portugal, but more importantly, a tradition of seafaring skills and boat building back to Portugal. So if you're interested and you wanna check out more and maybe support him, his project is called Break the Anchor. I'll have the link down in the description below. On a separate trip, Steve and I headed out east to New Bedford to talk to Captain Bob Glover and Bob Dollar at r and Ropes about Arabella's rig. And yeah, it's a little bit early for us to be talking about the rig, we know that, but the more we can figure out ahead of time, the better it will be. Also, they asked us to head out there, so we looked them up, we saw that r and had a great reputation and had a great amount of knowledge, so we couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk to them. After a fun and informative meeting, we headed up to Gloucester. 
We actually got an email from Nathan Burgess who heads up the Massachusetts chapter of the Traditional Small Craft Association and he actually asked us to speak to their group. So we got there early thinking we'd do a little sightseeing. Unfortunately, we were a little early in the season, so most things were closed. But we were speaking at the Maritime Gloucester Heritage Center, so we got a tour in there and got to meet a couple of its aquatic residents. After that, we decided we were going to try and go meet um, Harold Burnham at his workshop, but it was out of town. So we ended up just uh, walking around the museum there, which was also closed, and getting a little bit of inspiration from the remains of the Evelina M. Goulart. That evening, we had a great talk with Nathan and the rest of the group about how we got started on that crazy journey. We actually got our first video question coming from somebody you all may know, and so we'll adapt some of that talk for that answer soon, so keep an eye out for that video. Finally, we were invited to speak and to table at the Maine Boat Builder Show up in Portland, Maine. So we spent the weekend up there a couple weeks ago um, and had a great time meeting people. The show is really interested in getting the younger generations involved in maritime activities again, which is really going to be important if we want to keep this stuff alive. All weekend we got to talk to some amazing people, some vendors, some programs, and some of our viewers. It was just overall a great weekend. and We capped off the entire show with our talk. So thank you to Portland Yacht Services for inviting us, and more importantly to Stephen and Mary for putting us up for the weekend. Now let's get back to some boat work. So first of all, before we could get this shape, we needed to pick up patterns. And this is where the lofting floor comes in. And it's really hard to take the camera and show the little lines on the lofting floor that just don't show up. But you can imagine this picture is drawn out basically full size on the floor. And I take and put nails all the way around the piece that I want to take the pattern of. And then I flop a piece of plywood or a piece of lumber onto it, walk all over it, and when I get up, the nail heads imprint into that piece of wood. And then you can take the nails, sand them vertically, spring a bat and connect the dots, and you have something that looks remarkably like the drawing that's on the floor. If you're interested more in depth about the printing process and how we pick up patterns from the lofting floor, you can check out this earlier video and that'll show you in depth of how we go and we do all that process. Uh, it's something that we repeat over and over and over again through the boat building, so we don't want to be uh, you know, harping on it too much. But if you're looking for more info or you missed that video, check it out. So we did that earlier and we have the patterns for the deadwood fore and aft of the ballast keel. Now that we know what part of the boat we're working on making and we know where these patterns came from, let's go take a look at the patterns. These are the patterns that I pulled up off the lofting floor and we will use as we shape and design the deadwood. So this is the pattern for fore of the ballast keel and this is the pattern for aft of the ballast keel. The ballast keel will fit into these two jogs on either end. And this is going to end up coming out of a really big timber. Um, the top of this ends up being about a foot wide and it tapers down to about six inches at the bottom edge. And you know, you can see it's fairly deep. And what we're gonna end up doing is actually laminating that out of some thinner, smaller pieces. Since this is the dead wood, it's more or less just to fare in the boat in front of and after the ballast keel. And it does add some strength, but it's not a huge structural member. So we feel pretty confident about gluing it up out of some smaller pieces and bolting it on there. And then this is the aft pattern, which you can see is even bigger. This one's a bit more structural. The stern timber ends up coming into a, basically a mortise in the end. And that is an actual structural piece of the boat. So this aft one's a little bit more of a concern, but we're still gonna do the lamination because otherwise it would just be a massive, massive timber that we would have to cut this out of. When you're laminating a big timber like this, uh, one common vernacular is lifts. And basically that is each layer that gets glued up. Each layer would be a lift. So I drew in lifts on the other side of these so we could figure out how much timber we needed and what size. Um, so let's flip these over and we'll take a look at the lifts and how we're gonna end up gluing these, manufacturing these beams. So here we have the other side of the pattern and I've drawn in one, two, three, four, five lifts, which should give us the thickness that we need. I started that by drawing in a two and a half inch thick lift across the bottom. That is a worm shoe. So if you come a little bit closer, we can see kind of what that looks like and talk about what a worm shoe is. The first thing I did when I drew in the lifts was put in a two and a half inch thick worm shoe. And this is really important because the dead wood is on the bottom of the boat and that is one of the areas that is most likely to strike something. So if we did run aground, hit a rock or a reef or something, and we damage that paint on the bottom, 
these little crustaceans called shipworms will come into the wood if there's no paint to stop them and they'll come into the timber and they'll burrow horizontally following the grain and they can literally take a giant timber like this and just disintegrate it. It's amazing how much damage they can do. So the idea with the worm shoe is that it's sacrificial. So we'll put layers of paint and bedding compound between the rest of the deadwood and the worm shoe. We'll screw the worm shoe on with some bronze screws. And if we were to strike bottom and the worms were to get in here, in theory, the bedding compound and the anti-fouling paint would stop them hard at the line of the timber. And the worms, they could devastate all up and down the worm shoe um, but when we do a haul out and realize that that's damaged, it would be pretty easy to unscrew and replace that two inch thick timber on the bottom of the boat. And that's such a small timber that we could get a piece of hardwood pretty much anywhere in the world, slap it on there and be good to go. It's completely sacrificial. So once I had that worm shoe figured out where that was going to land, then I just took the biggest timbers that we had to work with, which are about five and a half, five and three quarters and figured we could plane them down to roughly five and a quarter and that would give us one layer another five and a quarter and that would give us almost the thickness that we need and those two glued and then through bolted together would give us a really strong aft deadwood uh, which is what we're going for here we have the four deadwood and i did basically the same exact process as i did with the aft deadwood i fit in the two and a half inch thick worm shoe I plopped on a nice and thick five and a quarter timber and then put some two and a half inch lifts to make up the last bit of the difference. And the four deadwood is not nearly as structural as the aft deadwood. So this one is even simpler and easier. Um, we're not super worried about strength, not super worried about anything other than keeping the worms out and making sure that we have a nice fair piece of wood that goes in front of the ballast keel. Um, so this one, as you can see, is way smaller than the aft deadwood and is a, a much easier one to put together. I love this bandsaw. Nah, it cuts really well. This lumber's a little hard for it because it twisted a little bit when it dried. So as you run it through the table, it doesn't want to like totally sit flat. Um, but with the bandsaw at a low speed, it, it handles it just fine. Here are the rough timbers that we're going to use for the deadwood fore and aft of the ballast keel. And they're roughed out about as far as we're going to take them right now. Uh, the reason for that is the timbers are pretty big and if we fo fully machine them now and they sit for three weeks until we need them, there's a chance that they'll dry out and they'll twist a little bit on us. And the other reason is that glue really likes freshly machined timber. So they're down to the point where all of the real big defects are cut around. The pith is cut out if the pith was in them. And they're all small enough that they can go through the thickness planer. So at this point, we're just going to let them sit and they can hang out here in the corner. And once we get the lead keel fared and painted and on top of the thickness wood keel, we can just run these through the thickness planer figure out exactly where they should be for the deadwood, glue them together, and shape the deadwood out of them. But if we go too much farther, we're just going to end up creating more work for ourselves. Because um, if we, like I said, if we bring them down to final thickness now and they move a little bit, we're going to have to go through the whole joining and uh, thickness planning operation again. So we might as well just wait a little bit and do that once when the time comes. But 
all the prep work, which is, you know, a good half day's work between doing the figuring and ripping the sides off these and getting them small enough to go through the bandsaw and then bandsawing them, that work will not need to be repeated and will make things go a little bit quicker once we get the warmer weather and can finally bolt these things together. So that's as far as we can go for now on the dead wood. So let's transition over and I think we'll do a little work on the lead keel today. Here's a riddle for you. How does shooting a propane tank with a 12 gauge shotgun slug, what does that have to do with building a wooden boat? Here we have our massive lead ballast keel. And one of the things we still need to do is fill in these craters that are left over from keeping the top open so that we didn't end up with any voids on the inside. So today I'm gonna take an old um, propane tank and turn that into a little bit of a melting pot. We'll melt some scrap lead and see if we can't top these things up a little bit. And before we top them up, we're gonna drill some holes down into them at an angle so that when we pour the lead into it, it kind of runs down into those holes. And if for some reason we don't get a good bond around here, there'll be enough kind of lead arms going in at odd directions that it should hold that piece of lead there. Um, this is gonna get the wood keel mated to it. So it's not a huge deal. We're just trying to fill them up so we don't have any big holes there. And this is a lot of fairing compound to go through. And it's about 100 pounds of lead, uh, would be my guess. So might as well make use of that and put the weight down low where it belongs. Yep, I'd say that put a hole in it. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Uh, so yeah, I shot it with a uh... A Rackmaster 12 gauge, two and three quarter inch lead slug. It's what you would use around here for deer hunting. There's the entrance hole. There's the exit hole. And the reason I did this is I want to use this propane tank, this old propane tank, um, for a melting pot for doing some lead work for topping up the ballast keel. And the valves were just super rusted, stuck on it. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get them unscrewed. And I figured it was better to take a walk down to the wood yard and spend, uh, you know, a buck fifty, two dollars on a shotgun slug, punch a hole in it from a safe distance so that I can then go home and fill it up with water and make sure there's no propane in it before I start cutting. Because my fear was that I was going to touch this thing with a grinder and there's going to be enough residual propane in there that this whole thing was going to blow up in my face. And I'd much rather it do that 30 yards downrange. Which it didn't do, but even just standing here, I can smell the propane off-gassing out of it. So we'll go home, we'll shove the garden hose in there, fill this thing up with water, clean it out really well, and then we'll cut it up and make it into a melting tank. Here is our recently shot and rinsed out propane tank. Uh, so we got a big old chunk of steel rod here, the grinder, the welding stuff. And the plan now is to cut just below where I shot it, open it up, make sure the inside seems solid, put the rod in there and figure out exactly how I want to uh, put handles on it so that Alex and I can pick it up and move it around and put it in the fire and pour it. But I think it's going to be kind of one of those make it up as I go along type deals. So I'm going to get it cut open and we'll see how thick and rigid it looks like and kind of just start playing stuff from there. But uh, the grinder's here, the tools are here, scrap metal piles right there. I'm sure we'll get it figured out. So we drilled the holes, melted some more lead, and filled in the major divots in the top of the ballast keel in anticipation for starting to mate the two keels together. Did you fill them open?
Mark. <laughs> Made your lead covered Easter egg. And if the weather starts to warm up like it should, we should hopefully be working on fairing and joining the two keels in the upcoming videos.